Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Weekend Chat with Researchers Season 3, Session 2. For those that are new here, we are Bugbeers, a research group at NCBS headed by Dr. Ashwin and, uh, and uh, welcome to Weekend Chat with Researchers. Hi, Meghna. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, can you please un unmute yourself? Hello. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Hi. Uh, can, can someone please respond? I don't know if I'm audible. Yes, Ganesh, you are audible. Ah, okay, fine. Okay. Okay, so I, I think I can take off from here. I don't know if there, I think there's something. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Megna. Yeah, yeah. You're back. Yeah. Hi. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Um, was there an issue there? Okay, no problem. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, so as I was saying, uh, we are bugbears. Uh, Research group at NCBS, headed by Dr. Ashwin, and this is our outreach channel. I am Meghna. I have with me today uh, Ganesh, and we'll be hosting today's session. We have another interesting poster for today's session by Vidya. Uh, what do you think it uh, trying it's trying to say, Ganesh? Yeah, hi Meghna, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome again. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I hope our audience must have taken a good look at the poster. Uh, once again, we have a very beautiful poster for this session uh, designed by our colleague Vidya. Uh, so everyone who saw the poster uh, must be sure that this session is going to be all about plants. Uh, it was so, you know, green and uh, we have plants everywhere in the poster. So what do we know about plants? Plants are omnipresent, right? Uh, and every organism on Earth will have to depend on plants at some point for its survival. Uh, we humans especially exploit a lot um, uh, exploit all possible resources from plants. Uh, plants are literally the greatest philanthropist of our planet. Uh, but have we ever taken uh, the side of plants uh, and seen the world from the imaginary eyes of plants? Uh, that is exactly what we are going to do in this session. Uh, so Dr. Shiva Prasad is going to take us to the plant world and uh, make us look from the perspective of the plants, uh, as the posters say. Um, so, Shiva Prasad is an associate professor at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, Shiva is working on uh, uh, plant epigenetics and his lab at NCBS is interested in understanding the different mechanisms uh, by which small RNAs uh, are synthesized in plants. Uh, they are also exploring the functions, roles of these small RNAs and their importance in uh, plant genome using a number of uh, plant models. Uh, with that, I welcome Dr. Shiva Prasad uh, to the second session of uh, uh, well, we can chat with researchers. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ganesh, for the kind introduction. So let me try sharing the slides, and then from there we can start. Yes, please. Okay, so I hope you can see my slides. Yes? Yeah, we can. can. Yes, yeah. yes, we can. Okay, so I will uh, welcome everyone. I would like to thank uh, Nitish, Ganesh, and Meghna for organizing this. All of them are in Ashwin's lab. And also for the very beautiful poster. And I thought it was done in no time. Okay, so today, um, so my name is Shiva Prasad. So this is how you can reach me uh, through email. Uh, we are in NCBS. 
uh, which is a, an organization under Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. All these nice beauties below, these are the model system we use in our lab. So today I'm going to give the side of plants. So that's why the title is Plant Perspective. Actually, this is a title chosen not by me, but by these guys, okay? So, uh, so what's the plant side? So this is, I hope you can see what I put on top. There is an island. The guy is thinking, oh, there is a boat coming to this, this small island. Uh, there is nothing in the island except one tree. And the guy is thinking, oh, finally I found a land, okay? So both are having their perspective. And well and good, there are two different perspectives. But have you thought about the perspective from this, this coconut tree? So on the, this side, it is thinking, guy, this single guy has taken all my coconuts. So come on now, there is one more guy coming. Now, is he going to cut all the leaves or the trunk or what is happening to me? So that's the kind of perspective we are going to see in this talk. So before we go, this is to just to remind all of us where we stand. So where we stand, in the if we count Earth's life as to 24 hours, divide into 24 hours, we have come just in the last four seconds, just time to say four, three, two, one, Whereas the life form started way early, something like almost um, 16 hours or so, the plants came something like five hours uh, in that time. So they're there, they're ancient, and compared to them, we are just newborns, okay? So all mammals came just, just in the last few minutes. So the earth is dominated by plants in this time, and of course there are bugs, then you can also see these ferocious animals, dinosaurs, they lived for an hour or so in the historical the, the time. And they, we don't know whether they really treated other organisms well. It looks like they didn't treat and they ended up disappearing altogether. So we are sort of doing that within that last four, four seconds or so in the, in the Earth's history. So um, in this time, though we all depend on plants, so we have this plant blindness. So this is a term coined by two researchers from University of Missouri. Uh, they thought nobody is thinking about plants. Let's see how many people can recognize plants. They gave this picture to 1,000 people in the campus in that university and tried to ask them, what do you see? 999% said they can see one, two, three lions. And only 1% said, oh, there is a beautiful acacia and there are, there are lions. So that is the kind of numbers we see. Very few people can really recognize plants because they are inert, they were not ferocious. We didn't have to worry them that much during our evolution. So why is that we don't, we have this blindness, okay? So we have this blindness because we think they can't do what we can do. All our energy has been put on two things, one on locomotion, second on consciousness. We are very proud that we can think a lot, etc. So the only way to remove this plant blindness is uh, the, somebody has to really start thinking about plants when they are very young, something like between two to six years or so. Uh, if those of you are teachers, you should give examples of plants along with animals so that everybody, everybody can understand these are beautiful life forms on earth. Now, the first question anybody asks, okay, you are saying all this, what, what about plants? Can they do all this, 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 this? And first thing is, can they move? Because we are thinking we can move. So bladder word, it is one of the fastest reversible reaction. So this is a small uh, plant sitting in the water. Um, so one second has one million microseconds. That's the time. Uh, uh, Sanjay Sani's lab in NCBS, they have found uh, almost a decade ago, that's the time this bladder work takes to just close these bladders so that they can capture the prey. And after some time, this is released. Now, this reaction is almost as par, on par with some of the fastest reactions we do. That's during our thinking. Uh, what about other ways? So this is tumbleweed. So this is a one of the famous tumbleweed is Russian thistle. So we know now Russia, we are hearing about Russia a lot. These tumbleweeds, when they combine together, they can roll on the plains. Now they are very common in uh, North America. 
they can beat a car in speed in no time plus they when they go around rolling around in these planes they can disseminate the seeds faster way faster than we can do okay so uh, the the end result is the the way the shape of this this tumbleweed is such that it can climb the obstacle just from wind and once it starts it won't stop it will keep on going until it is completely disintegrated the model of this just tumbleweed has been so useful for us to uh, make these probes to which can walk on moon and other places so it can just go see that's that's the that's how fast they can move that means they can move so it's not that they are they are they are not moving so the examples i've given here are the things which can move very fast okay what about the sheer way to conquer the area and spread is it not that it is called as movement so this on top is timamma marimannu this is the largest tree on earth roughly 100 kilometers north of bangalore uh, in andhra pradesh so the story is that one lady she died and uh, the, from there from our ashes you got this this ficus tree and this tree is as big as the neighboring village it's around 800 uh, meters wide so that's roughly the neighboring village you can see this is google images so in the middle you have an empty space that's where initially the ficus came and now it has spread in the last couple of 100 years so in between you will see all these spreading plants which is moving everywhere from that but it usually starts this is also called a strangler fig because it can go attack a palm usually the seed is deposited by a bird usually a crow from this it comes strangles the whole ficus uh, and the start spreading that's why in the middle of almost every ficus tree you will see a hole that's where children usually like to hide in the middle right so this is a sheer movement which is unparalleled something that animals can only hope to do of course we want to strangle but not this way right so this is almost dissipating one of the strongest trees that is the big palm now uh, shiva uh, sorry have... to interrupt you yeah yeah we have a couple of questions on youtube uh, so uh, shastrika is asking how do tumbleweeds grow and uh, nitesh almost has the same question about tumbleweeds how do these tumbleweed get their nutrition if they are not attached to the ground so the tumbleweed would... itself is set of plants they can come together when they are about to die and then they make this mass okay they will be full of seeds and then they assume that round shape or round shape then they can start going around when there is a wind and go for hundreds of kilometers spreading so these are plant remnants so they are not exactly living but if they become stationary in another place then they are still living they can start making roots and come up okay yeah yeah okay we have another question from youtube uh, if the tumble wheel can roll around then where are its roots situated i mean i think okay i understand yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah 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 okay yeah. so we would can... also like to um, ask our audience to ask more questions in the youtube chat section and we would ask them here okay great so the second question obviously can plants sense so yes they can sense they are sensors whatever we are using so uh, we use the tongue let's say spicy food we need few cells in the throat to sense it same way plants have much many more specialized sensors way more than us literally everywhere so i am sure you are all familiar with these five senses which are very fond of so we need specific areas eyes to look at everywhere right take a plant every leaf every leaf not just one leaf is capable of doing the same and in much much wider spectrum looking at different type of light depending on the light start doing different things so they have way more sensors than us and literally the whole plant without any discrimination they are all can each each part of the plant each leaf can do the same so look at this thigmotropism so the plant the tendrils can go and attach to another plant just based on the touch they are so clever if you keep a dead stalk in some plants they won't go and climb you need a living one of the same type to go and climb 
So they can move towards water, they can move towards sun, all these you are very familiar with. They can move towards the chemicals during their reproduction and other times. Um, they can move towards earth. Within the earth, few centimeters below the ground, they can sense whether it is two centimeter or it is six centimeter, okay? So they can also touching everything, all these senses that we are proud of. They can do exactly the same and way more faster than us. So why am I saying faster? So many of us, we grow pot bellies because our tummy, which we are very proud of ourselves, cannot recognize that it has got full. After eating, it takes 20 minutes for us, our brain to know we are full. But plants can respond to such all these cues in few minutes, in few seconds sometimes, okay? So uh, do they have a brain? So if they can sense, but I said each is, is, then obviously the question is, we are all conscious, we can think a lot, can they have, do they have a brain? So Darwin, in one of these very old books, which is free on, on Google, anybody can download, he thinks that one of those plant part, which is in the, just where the leaves come from, acts like the brain of one of the lower animals, it receives impressions from sense organs and direct into several different movements. He even somebody like Darwin thought they can have something like a like a uh, brain. So is he really right? He's partly right because that same thing can be done not just by that part. Throughout the plant, plants are the same way to sense. They are the same kind of a consciousness. Okay. So animal nerve cells talk to each other with the aid of an amino acid called glutamate, and it helps to set off. We uh, help set off a wave of calcium ions in the adjoining cells, so it goes around, start doing different things. So what about plants? So this is a model plant called Arabidopsis. On the end, which I am showing, somebody has added 100 millimolar, very low amount of the same glutamate, what we are proud of, same thing for plant. Within 110 seconds, that is within two minutes, the signal has been perceived, the calcium signal throughout the plant it has spread. So it's exactly what actually we do, except that this is not just the brain, the whole plant is sort of acting like a brain. So they really don't need a brain because they have the same sense, same thing everywhere. Now, can they now hear and do something? Yes, they can hear. This is a very beautiful experiment which came from uh, a, a, this apple and cock frog. What they see is that plants can sense from the wind or other noises, they can see if an insect is chewing a neighboring plant. So that's the, the, the chewing noise. They can check how much it is, velocity, amplitude, and distinguish from the noise. And if they do, the same leaf, the same plant in the other part of the plant is now ready to face to a defense uh, or an offense with the, with the insect partner. Uh, unlike humans who gossip all the wrong things, plants gossip nice things, they're going to say, look, there is an insect trying to chew. All of you get ready now, okay? So these signals are airborne. They can go signal to the next plant. Next plant is ready. And look how beautiful it is done. Unlike us, we just, we don't want to tell the good news to everyone or the bad news, right? So... Uh, uh, do they feel pain? So this is more like a emotional question one can really ask. Um, so why do we worry? Because we know that during, if we don't feel pain, we, do, we would not have existed. During one of those earliest experiment with fire, our ancestor would have burned to death, right? Uh, I don't think plants consider pain or death the way we think because uh, so look at this picture, there is a huge wildfire. After the fire, there are these plants which can, which are actually waiting for the fire, including these trees, they might have shed some old wood, but then they'll regrow. There is nothing lost. There is no pain so much that they should be, they don't have to feel pain. So you must have seen all these trees with the holes in them, worrying if you are really sensitive about trees, what has happened, nothing has happened to the tree because most of the dicots inside the stem is all dead cells. What's living is just thin layer on the outside. So that's all, there's the living tissue. In the middle, it's all dead tissue. 
issue. So it doesn't matter to them. So they can live happily ever after within, with a bird or, or somebody else. So many trees, in fact, uh, they want somebody to cut them so that they regrow in much more better fashion, get better light, get better nutrients. So they just don't care. So they don't need that, that kind of a feeling for pain. In fact, most of the fruits, if, or if you don't create a pain, they just are not going to have sexual reproduction. They're not going to have flowering like in, like in guava. So if you don't do anything to the guava, don't create any pain, you, do, you want it to ha live happily, it will end up making a very bitter two fruits from branches such as this, okay? So every farmer who grows knows that to make the fruits, you have to do multiple things. One, chop everywhere in multiple places and bend this branch, sort of mimicking a very high wind damage. Then from those bent branches, you will get copious amount of fruits. So if you consider making a fruit, that's an offspring is a success. They just don't care. They want that to happen so that now they can they can initiate how to make fruit from the from the trees. Sorry, I think Shiva. Meghna, you had a question. Yeah, we have very uh, interesting questions from the YouTube chat section. Uh, Shashrika asks, how do plants know when they are hungry? So they are not really thinking of hunger the way we think. Okay, when there is a resource. They are ever ready. They have the root system. They have the leaves ready. If there is a sunshine, they are going to grab it. Okay? So if there is something in the root, they are going to, near the root, they are going to grab it. They are ever hungry. At the same time, they can shut the hunger and sometimes keep years without eating. So, okay? So there is nothing like a feeling of hunger. Even in the middle of the day, there is a sunshine. Suddenly, the clouds have come. They will shut down. They are okay. They will do other activities happily. And then when the sunshine comes, they will resume back. Okay? Their, their food preparation. Okay? The next question so, uh, comes from Harini, who asks, what makes plants know where to go? In other words, what does its sense organs tell it to do? Okay, so its objective is to find more water, more nutrients, and more sunlight, right? So most of them. There are also trees which don't like much sun sunshine. They want to hide below some other trees. So that's all they are looking for. Where is more water? Roots will try to go there. Where is more nutrient? Roots will go there. Where is more sunshine? The branches will decide which direction has more sunshine or chance of sunshine grow there, make branches, spread in such a way that you harvest maximum so that you can make more food. A final question from uh, Shastrika. How do non-carnivorous plants defend themselves? How do non-carnivorous plants defend themselves? I think we are going to see how they defend themselves. The carnivorous plants don't just defend themselves. They are actually uh, supplementing their food with extra little bit non-edge food. But all plants defend themselves very, very nicely, and we are going to see in the next few slides. Okay, now, do they have sense? Now you have, you have, you have ability to sense, but do they have sense? We are all very happy that we can, you know, we have the ability to think and do under things. So these are plants, every plant has this thin hairs called trichome. So these trichome have different genome composition. These are the sensors. For example, if there is a bit of a rain, rain usually brings fungal and other pathogens. Just the tip of, you know, just touching these or spraying water is going to activate this calcium signaling, which I mentioned, which is also common in our, uh, uh, in us and almost every organism. Most of the animals in NCBS, Gaithis lab has done some fantastic work on this. The calcium sensor is active just by spraying little water. So you can see how beautifully this can be seen in few seconds. You can all trichome is those this pointy things. They go up, they upregulate the calcium sensing. They sense there is a transcription factor, a protein, which will go in a wave. And when it goes in a wave, all the neighboring tissues are going to have more resistance for the possible incoming pathogen. This is like, imagine a human can do this. You are going to play now rugby. Suddenly you have got extra muscles and extra bones and all kinds of things so that you are, you are ready to face. 
the, basically that's the kind of mechanism plants have. Just water itself, they know their evolutionary memory is way more powerful than the four second memory that we have evolved. So that memory is enough to, for them to tell rain means pro problem, let's all upregulate all the defense mechanisms so that if that happens, the transcription factors will upregulate all the resistant genes, which will counter the possible pathogen. So once this happens, this wave, when it passes, the plant is already ready to cope with the pathogen. So there are other ways to measure this sense, okay? So we know all these uh, kind of different uh, touches or shyness. See, this is how a canopy looks. Each plant has a very nice, this is called canopy shyness, they are not going to intrude and go up, go in the area of the next tree. So anywhere, including the NCBS campus, if you tend to look up instead of the phone, you will see this beautiful pattern. Each tree gives that, it's, it's called canopy shyness, space for the neighbor, whether it is the same type or a different type, okay? So just like the WWO, the web we have, roots are the real major connections, so this can be called as wood wide web. This connects not just the neighboring tree of the same type. No, there is no, no caste, no religion, no country border. All trees are connected. They can go and tell what's happening above ground. They can tell where is the nutrient and where is the problem, okay? So with these examples, I guess you're going to agree with us that plants, you know, they, they should probably Look at, if you are laughing at them, they must be also laughing at us. So, um, Ashwa, we have a couple of questions on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so, Harini is asking, how is it possible that a guava might become bitter if we don't do anything to the plant, except for giving water? Yeah, okay. So, when you don't do that, that's, let me put that picture. This bitter one, it is not going to really, it has come out from a densely see the do you see the change in the leaves the type of leaves which will grow in the normal plant which is not pruned is way different from the leaves which you see after pruning this means most of the time the fruit is hiding from sun it is just making very few seeds it's not really like a full-fledged sexual reproduction the meristems are like not really strong enough to make good fruits I'm sure if you go to any orchard, just for guava, you'll be able to pick these two types of guava from the same tree. And these, which are usually in the branch with a very tiny twig, just tiny twig with multiple fruits, will be way more, actually they are light color, whereas the ones which will come here will be dark green. And these hardly ripe, they don't ripe. No, they'll stay bitter. And maybe if you order online, that's what you get. If you go and buy, this is what you will get, okay? Because we know that you, which one might be more tasty. Okay. Yeah. And one more question uh, from Inda. Uh, so he's asking, we can tell if water is drinkable or not by smell or sight or by other senses. Do plants all uh, are also able to tell heart and shoes whether to uptake uh, water or not? Absolutely. They sense the quality may be better than us. They don't need a water purifier. Of course, their own system of root itself. Uh, we should not think that you know the dirty water with cow dung is bad. It's bad for us, but that is the one which is the best water for the plant. So maybe a double distilled water, it gives only water molecule. It's not really that good for plant. So the quality of plants in plant sense, it knows where to find it and when to take it. If you add a toxic substance to the water, it is going to have to not to take up that water and starve, okay? And that starvation can go on for a long time. We have another question. Uh, if any one tree in the wood web is affected, are others affected? What, what uh, effect does it have? Just one, if one of them are affected, all the neighboring trees know there is a dangerous thing sitting there. And they are already ready. They will build up these chemical defenses, which I will come, you know, in a couple of minutes. They are all ready, and very likely they will be able to subdue the pathogen. And that's why in a normal forest with the different species, nothing is going to happen. There will not be a disease. The disease comes only if you make a monoculture of same trees. 
all around then even if one has come it doesn't have the mechanism to cope with the the pathogen then they might have a problem but in natural forest you will rarely ever see a disease so trees have a greater sense of community than us yes i would say so but this is all we are talking about plants perspective see perspective changes right so each yes. person has a is a different so we are just trying to see what can be plants perspective okay now even after this i'm sure all of you can name 10 breeds of dogs or cats or any animal of every type including the ancient dinosaurs which nobody has seen alive but can you name 10 of these 10 strawberries 10 of the sledges or hedges or any of those i guess most of you can no very rarely one can because we just don't care for plants we don't recognize for the plants though not just they do all the service for us they are part of our life every day you end up seeing them doing something with what they produced not just for eating but 100 different ways see how historically they have contributed to us i'm going to give example of just two plants which you might not have known i am not going to give the example of things which you already may be known because we seem to be caring only about plants that offer us dramatic covid resistance except that we don't care uh, other than disease resistance they we don't care so the in the map what you see is the greatest hedge line that was ever built in the history and this is called inland customs line and this line which is roughly 4000 kilometers ago around 200 years ago this was active this started from pakistan all the way to orissa the purpose of this customs line is to protect smuggling of salt during the british time which is somewhere in here near jaipur you have the sambar lake you have gujarat making lot of salt they didn't want this salt to go to the heavily populated areas where there is demand for salt unless they pay tax so to prevent this smuggling they built a roughly 4 to 10 meter wide hedge line just with few plants and sometimes the plants were already there sometimes they brought from everywhere and this was really implemented by a guy we all know is evo hume what did he do he is the one who started a uh, uh, congress party in the country so this custom line now it's there is a only very tiny uh, uh, the hedge line which is the second biggest longest man made wall after chinese wall is still there near mathura okay so what does this hedge line have this was impenetrable nobody could cross through from one end to another mostly at this plant this is also called as jesus thorn you can see this this pointy thorns and it has very beautiful flowers very fragrant so this plant is called carissa caranda it is also called caranda and different names and this makes very beautiful fruits which can be eat which are edible for those who eat but we know them from different reason if you end up eating a ice cream with a cherry on top that's not cherry that is this caranda fruit which is pickled and dipped in sugar and color okay i'm sure you have all of you have eaten thinking that what a beautiful cherry is it's not it's a weed which is part of this hedge line okay uh the white combs if you end up getting a white comb it is very very likely it is from this this tree if you end up seeing this jelly which is part of different preparation it is coming from this fruit of course there is pickle uh, many medicinal uses tested and untested but each one of you have seen this product and consumed it or used this product so that's that's one example the second example is sort of my favorite example this is called nadaswaram tree this is tree is called hardwickia bynata uh, that tree is hard but the name didn't come because it is hard it name came from a, a a wandering sort of a general who ended up making the best collection of uh, plants after he made them to paint from india uh, so this is called nadaswaram it is the loudest world's loudest non brass wind instrument and the whole body is made up of this tree the tree so these are the famous exponents of this this uh, band this is you would hear every marriage people will be blowing this right this is the biggest noise in a marriage way beyond what humans can make and to do this you need this wood this is the strongest 
densest wood in India. It might be also in the whole world, but definitely we know it is in India. This is so hard. In ancient days, just the, the, the ball bearings in these wheels were made from, not from brass. When there is a shortage of brass, it was made from this wood. So now I guess you can see how strong this wood must be. And the same property is useful in making this, this uh, uh, instrument. This instrument, see they are blowing for hours together. There will be a lot of water coming from their mouth. And this tree doesn't care. It stays, it is not going to, it's waterproof. It is strong. It is not going to have um, literally no problem. It has its own sort of oily covering. And to get this wood, it is grown throughout the South India. Actually, this is one of the most beautiful tree in this March, in March, because every tree would have shed their leaves. The first set of leaves which you see with the light green in the, in the hills, anywhere in, in, in the Eastern Ghats or surrounding areas, they come up and they'll be, the, they'll be like torches in the, in the forest. And these trees are everywhere. The closest near uh, Tiruvannamalai, there is a huge uh, gregarious formation of this tree. So this is the type of leaf it has. It is the, the instrument. To get this instrument, they can't just go and tap this tree. The wood has to be preserved. They go to the old houses, get these wooden frames in the, in the door, uh, 100 years old, 50 years old, to make this. There is no substitute for this tree. If you end up seeing this instrument, that is the wood it is derived from. Not just that, the fiber from the bark is the one which people use to tie elephants. And the, the, uh, whatever the stain that resin comes from this tree is the only cure for elephant sores. Okay, so somebody has to prepare that and go and rub it on the elephant. The leaves are also eaten by, by uh, domestic animals. If you see chest ponds made with this color, if it is white, there are other colors. If it is this color, it is from the same wood. So hundreds of different ways this tree is known to us. And I don't think if you, if you are traveling in a, in a vehicle, you might recognize this tree, okay? So well, we continue to depend on plants, whether we recognize them or not. We depend on them for food, clothing, medicines, and shelter. There is hardly anything changed in our history, in our last four seconds in the Earth's history. We just depend on them. On top of gaining all these, we want now more food, even under climate, difficult climate condition. We want climate resilient crops that doesn't care what happens to the climate. Our aim is to get higher yield in all seasons in a sustainable manner. Sustainable is a very wrongly used word. If somebody you know, uses non-cotton cloths, when they wash, they are going to shed so much plastics, right? So if somebody has to say there is a sustainable thing, there is a, you need to go back to almost a Gandhian way of living. So that's almost not possible to expect from plants because it's the amount of burden we have put on plants, it's like uh, making them carry one ton weight, like a two-wheeler carrying one ton weight, and now we want them to carry two tons, okay? So this, to improve, if you have to improve the yield, incremental knowledge, just changing small things is not going to be enough. So we have to try to see why plants make all this, right? So we just, we, after this discussion, we know they are living, they are happy, they can do most of what we do, but they also provide all this for us and other animals. Why the hell they have to do this? So they are very clever. So if you go back to the uh, dinosaur time, uh, that's exactly when some of the plants started thinking, why just leave it alone? Let's have a nice collaboration with the animals. So that is the birth of all the flowering plants. Flower means there is a way to attract them so the plants can uh, make them spread, the animals, uh, can spread them, their genes by bribing with flowers or nutritious seeds. So if the seed is colorful and nutritious, very likely animal will spread it everywhere. And this collaboration, of course, animals evolved very nicely because there is now food security. Plants also evolved because they made use of animals' ability to move, that is locomo locomotion. And this is so successful. If you look at any place, 
most of the plants now you see are flowering plants, including in NCBS campus or anywhere else. So they've been, they've come in the no time, like a few minutes of what's time, and now they have conquered the whole world because they thought it is better to have a nice collaboration with animals. In this collaboration, I mentioned animals, even animals which did not really have nice diversity, started having very huge diversity. So to do this, they just plants knew that animals are capable of moving around. They could end up becoming just the lunch, no benefit for the plants. So plants thought we should make a lot of chemicals. Of course, they are the best chemists in the world. They knew the art of breaking water to get oxygen, right? So there is a, usually we think uh, they break carbon dioxide to make oxygen. That's not true. You can see in this thing, they break water. If we have to do in lab, we have to do electrolysis, pass the current and get very little of it. But plants knew how to do it. They could grab and make this using sunlight which falls everywhere, all this means, green means wherever there are a lot of plants, which is literally covering all of the earth's surface and also in oceans. So just to ensure that this light is captured very nicely, completely, trees developed all kinds of different shape of leaves, depending on where they are, there are leaves with tips which can drain the water nicely, they can fold, make sure they are not damaged with wind, so they covered, used this sunlight from nothing, literally from nothing, they started making this food and oxygen. And most importantly for a lot of animals and for themselves, they could use sugar, make much more of that. Now, the many of the things which they could make from these meager substances, almost no input, include hundreds and thousands of different compounds that we use all times. So one, again, one example, they make hundreds of different compounds. One of them is called terpene. So this is a product, if you tap the tree, you'll get kgs of this. If you burn it, you get a compound called rosin. Just like what I mentioned about two other plants, I'll just give you example of how in everyday life we use it. So there are at least 50,000 different types of terpene. We are talking about one of them, okay? So of course, the person who made a lot of research on this get, got a Nobel in way back in 1939. Uh, he, you must be wondering why is that a plant person who worked on plants got Nobel? This complete name of his, the, the description of his Nobel says terpenes and derivatives of human sex hormones. So, all, all steroids are terpenes. Triterpenes are, are steroids and sex hormones. So uh, one of these rosin, it is everywhere. So for string instruments, you have to use this. For the baseball pitcher or the marking, just to get the traction, or for dancers to get the grip, or in the coating in medicines, the nice coating which you get, all these are rosin. On vaccine, these act as adjuvants. In paints, these are really needed. Soap covering is filled with rosin. Printer cartridge, all kinds of printing, Xeroxing, everywhere you need rosin, okay? We consume also as food, we need in lenses. And, and this picture, what is this? If somebody holds the pure rosin and rub their fingers, you get the smoke. So that's how many of our sadhus could cheat nicely by showing you make the new fire in just the fingertips, okay? so. It's a food colorant, E915 is rosin, which we all, we all use. Um, literally, you know, chewing gum is, has this, 100 different ways you use it, okay? But what is the use for the plant? So plants are very clever. The, just they make this as a way to make the bandage. These are the ones which prevent any attack of, they, they seal the area, they prevent attack from other organisms. And they also use the terpene in different ways. I'm sure you have heard about cloud seeding. Our state is very much interested in getting cloud seeding to get a bit more rain. When terpene is spread around in the forest in the right season, that is the biggest cloud seeding experiment plants do, and they get a lot of rain. I think when we use silver iodide, which is one of the costly compound to make silver, uh, um, cloud seeding, we may get rain or we may not get rain. Most of the time we don't get rain. So, okay, so that's the, that's the use of this for the plant. 
now plants ended up uh, making... sure. uh, yeah yeah uh, sorry for interruption so we have few questions on the chat box or so i would like to ask that uh, so harini is asking how long can a plant start it depends some of the plants which are in the in the uh, cold deserts in north america they are living from since 10000 years sometimes when they have a off season many of those in the northern hemisphere six months they can easily start because below them is ice they can't absorb water there is no sunshine so some of them if you keep the seed they can live forever so okay. so there is no limit if you have alga after freezing you can end up opening a make the alga to live after i don't know thousands of years oh yeah interesting uh, and ashashika has a question uh, in the wood wide web what if a tree dies what happens to the remaining nutrients left in that tree it will be re- immediately replaced by another tree which will find its way find the right area for it and start connecting the web back the missing web pieces will fall in place in no time so if you clear one tree in the middle of the forest there is a huge activity there will be plenty of things come they will come grow and cover it in no time okay uh, so inder has an interesting question uh, can plants in wood wide uh, wood wide web lie to each other for their own benefit of nutrition and growth uh, sorry you have to repeat that question oh uh, okay so can plants in the wood web lie to each other for their own benefit of nutrition and growth so there they have the benefit because this connections are also fungi called mycorrhiza including their roots the roots are in mycorrhiza are in the roots so they help to acquire maximum nutrients most of the time different trees don't fight with each other they share the nutrients so if there are no nutrients not many trees will germinate and and come up so when they come up they ensure that some trees try to have a uh, bias for their own seedlings uh, some trees don't have the bias so if they have a bias they will ensure that only their daughter or son came up by providing some chemicals so other trees cannot grow there is a lot of complex reactions going on in the wood wide web okay thank you i think we can carry on for now okay so plants make lot of carbohydrates way more than what they need they also make lot of protein which are the bribes that they give to animal but because they are sitting in one place they end up making rest of the plants not suitable for the for the consumption so nicotine in in tobacco you know is a component in bds and cigarettes it can damage the muscles collagen is lost then there is no muscle caffeine stops hunger in all animals scopolamine is a medicine for parkinson's in low dose slightly higher dose as in datura induces madness no animal can think of food when it is mad right cyanide stop life cycle of literally most of the animals so these are all ways plants have ensured that what is bribe in the fruit or seed or flower you can have nice interaction with us but just don't meddle with us anywhere else so they can also in the fruit also you can have variations flavonols these are compounds in in plants such as gooseberry it tastes bitter but after that everything tastes sweet that means it is ensuring that you don't end up emptying the tree so it tastes bitter whatever else you eat it, it becomes sweeter same way there are flavonols which taste sweet after that whatever you eat can be bitter so then there are there are they also go at length such as in wild barley these have chemicals stronger than ethidium bromide one of the strong mutagens to stop to induce changes to macromolecules that is dna rna and protein then there are bribes called anthocyanins and and flavonols these are in flowers and fruits so i'll have a slide little maybe in 5 minutes later but a lot of plants also have this compound so this is cannabis these are all supposed to be altering our consciousness we end up consuming them not just for food but to alter our consciousness maybe plants have the last laugh because once you start getting addicted there is no way out so nearly 10% of all plants are have these hallucinogenic properties and we also use most of them as medicine because at low doses they can help us as medicine 
Now, this balance went on really, really long time, right? Even after we came or all other animals came, four hours of Earth's time is filled with such beautiful interactions and everybody thrived very nicely until plants started playing with us, our mind. That's when they started us, targeted us. You can move easily and we have really capability to destroy a lot of things. So some plants thought we are the best way to help them to spread everywhere. And these are plants which are those which did this. These are, these are cereals. They don't have colorful flowers, but they can make a lot of carbohydrate which can be stored for long. This is the birth of houses where people started staying in one place, borders and so on. And because these plants can be easily cultivated, we end up started making houses and growing them and started fencing, all that. Plus we started clearing the whole earth just to pamper these plants. So literally we ended up spending our time, 90% of the earth's surface is literally converted to make way for these crops. So crops became really most, one of the most dominant life forms, especially something like rice. Okay, so this is the birth of modern agriculture where we change the face of the earth. This is like a watershed moment in the history of earth. And here, the bargain. Of course, we both evolve, humans and these cereals. There is more grain for us, but dominance in numbers and pampering goes for the crops. So sometimes the pampering goes to such a level that if you don't pamper them, they are not going to make the grains. Plants such as cauliflower, can live nicely, but end up making zero whatever flower if you don't pamper them, okay? Well, so during this time, uh, we ended up selecting plants and they made us to do a lot of hundred different things. So maize is the product of this artificial selection by us. It is a staple in many countries. It's a poor source of protein. This is the wild species of maize. And this is what you can see now. So almost one and a half foot long maize is what we, can, we have made from this wild species of grass, which made very few of them. So a lot of factors contributed to making this change. So if you see the comparison of this maize evolution with that of transport, on top you can see from wheel to flying car, we have moved a long way, right? Same way from these plants, which could make very few grains, we have moved a long way to make this. Just like movement transport has evolved in the last few decades in heaps and bounds, the evolution of these plants were, uh, was also in heaps and bounds. So what we did, we used, started making a term called biotechnology where we have two meanings, innovation to use plants to make products of use to humans, that includes carbohydrates and, and proteins, and also try to make genetic modification with them, without our knowledge, to make all these nice fruits and vegetables. So common things, one of them is called tissue culture. You can chop a plant, put them in the right medium, end up making all the plants, all the banana plants, which grow mature uh, exactly when you have Ganesh Chaturthi. So you know, you can use the tissue culture. Almost every banana you might be eating is coming from a tissue culture. Here you can multiply, but you can't make the products of your choice. So, but in this method, which is called grafting, which is roughly around 800 years old now, you can combine the properties of two plants, such as in pomato, this plant can make potato below, tomato on the top, the plant is very useful. All you need to do is cut and bring two branches together. Plants inside them, they have very nice tissue called cambium, which can bridge grow back, literally produce a new plant or a new flower from, from like stump like this. So this can fuse two regions and start combining the properties of both plants. So this method is very good, but only for fruit crops, not for other type of crops. But what really changed is what is called as hybridization, bring two plants, cross them together, and then you get suddenly dramatic plants, such as this watermelon, this is the hybrid, the wild one, nobody can eat it. This is bitter and very small with seeds. Now we have watermelons like this. So literally almost all plants that we use, either artificially in the recent past, we have made them hybrid or they were hybridized in the last 10,000 years. So this kind of 
product can be made artificially by breeding, but it is very slow. It uses brute force. If you don't know what brute force means, if you have lost the password, four digits, you try every digit, every combination. That's what a breeder ends up with. But even then, results can be undesirable. So this has happened 10,000 years, but not really something you can dramatically change. So still, we ended up making most of what we eat are hybrids, as I mentioned, such as this orange. Orange, the color is orange, but the real orange is not orange. It is green. So now we call the name of the fruit into color. And when you say orange, somebody will not think about fruit. They will first think about orange color. So that's what we have done. Literally, every fruit has its own, its own history. So now genetic modification bypasses all these changes. You, you can introduce that small change in a given plant and start making plants that can cope with all the stresses, such as virus attack, or start making very important products, uh, such as beta carotene, which can alleviate blindness. This is vitamin A, pro-vitamin A. And the gene, the uh, rice is now called golden rice. This has the capability to cure all kinds of uh, malnutrition in, in developing world. So the problem with genetic modification is that it has poor public opinion. It needs a lot of expertise. And plus, one has to really know what to do uh, when, when you, when you and how to understand how to implement this technique. Now, how to do this transformation is you need to take the help of a bacteria which lives in the, in the soil all the time. It tends to make these tumors in all kinds of plants and take a bit of this genome, bit of uh, its, its uh, DNA and put your gene what you want to and now the agrobacterium is blind. If you introduce to agrobacterium now, when agrobacterium infects a new plant, it will make that new gene, new bring the new property to make the new protein and the new product is born. If somebody is wondering whether it is really unnatural, so I'm sure these are the pictures I have taken from very close by here in GKK. All these tubers are result of agrobacterium infection. Uh, that means agrobacterium has put its genes. So these are all transgene. And I'm sure you are not going to get worried whether the mango you are eating is transgenic or not, but these are transgenic tissues, okay? So uh, naturally, it has, this agrobacterium has done a lot of interesting things. Sweet potato was never a sweet potato. It was a, just a plant. Agrobacterium infected the roots past its genes, which can make this sort of like tubers. And now we have the sweet potato. So uh, its, its history is like roughly 8,000 years. I'm sure nobody thinks about sweet potato as a, as a genetically modified organism. So with all these changes, including GMO, we are now really produced hell lot of food than in this abundance of food never seen in our history. That means a lot of humans could proliferate more, and our population is the highest ever in the recorded history. So just see how much food we have produced. Two million US farmers can generate food for two billion. That's one fourth of the total population, but what they grow is maize, it goes to pigs or, or to make biofuel. Still, because of this inequality, we have malnutrition and shortage of food. So with all this, that's really like the, like the way the plants have succeeded because they cover everywhere. They make us to give very, sometimes very costly inputs so that they can give us these grains. So one of the questions we ask, if I have time, I will explain maybe two things that we do and then I wind up. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we try to see how is that rice, which is a, our most famous, most popular plant came from. The wild species of rice, wild relative is like monkey to man, sort of, not exactly, but somewhat. These plants are still in the edge of lakes. They have very few stems, very few seeds, seeds fall out, right? From this, in the last 10,000 years, we have made them to these plants, which are strong stem, ability to have a lot of leaves and a lot of grain, which stay back, right? So we try to see how these things happen. And there are many people in the world who want to see how these things happen. How is that plants now are able to produce so much for our benefit? Also, what we think. 
right? So when we try to see what this is happening, the wild species of rice is called Horizon Nivara. These are present in edge of lakes throughout the subcontinent. They don't make much grains, maybe two grains per plant, three grains per plant. And what has changed from this plant to what we see now? So we try to see what has changed. Obviously, one would think that the book of recipe, that is nothing but DNA in each of our cell. Every living cell has this book of recipes. And from this, one can copy the recipe to RNA, as RNA. And this recipe, when somebody cooks, you get a dish of protein. So this is what is made up of in every organism. Though you have the same book of recipe in all humans, we end up making different dishes. That's why we look different. That is true for every organism. So just by having book of recipes, there is no guarantee you make the right dish or the right amount of dish. And this is checked by a set of molecules, sort of sutures called small RNAs. So this is a, uh, this work got Nobel in 2006. And this is the kind of signaling checks or the switches we work in the lab. We thought what exactly whether there is a ch chance for these switches to make the rice to make it more, more produce more of the grain. So we genes make RNAs, RNAs make protein. The dish I said, it will end up making changes to us and all the organisms. Organisms live in the environment. Then they have to pass this back to the same DNA, right? That happens with the term called epigenome. So what we know is that this set of signal molecules, they can regulate not just checking which recipe is to be copied to make how much of protein, but also whether the recipe book itself has to be changed. So the recipe book can be changed because the DNA, the recipe is bound by these proteins. These proteins, if you change a little bit, the way one can read this book changes and it is an irreversible process. So you can make it forever, change this forever. What we find is that such a mechanism is everywhere, both in plants and animals, very commonly seen where the, where the four digits of this recipe, ATGC, so English has different 20 letters, but, but our own genome has only four letters, ATGC, just the letters don't change, but the way this book can be read can be changed. And this is leading to all kinds of phenotypes, including in hybrids, in ants, the same DNA, same recipe, you make different dishes, you make either minor worker or major worker, or the queen can suddenly change and make a forager into a next queen. Okay, so when we tried to work previously, we found that all the, most of the hybrids we saw in, in tomato were because of the such changes in the way the plant can sense how to read the recipe and how much of protein should be made. So what we saw in rice is that the similar change has taken place. In wild rice, some signals are now made so that the plant has less of stability mechanically. So these plants don't need much mechanical stability. They grow in the, in the paddy field, in the lakes. They are prostrate plants. They don't have to have much, much of the grains. But during domestication, now this signal is lost. So the protein is made to make a lot of lignin, which provides mechanical strength. So this is the single change, which has led to a lot of change in the phenotype. And the plant is now making a lot of grains for us. So the same is true for colors such as fruit colors or flower colors. These are also influenced by the way how one can copy the recipe and how one can make the right dish, that is the right protein. So this is again, a, everybody, even men are fond of flowers because flowers means there is a promise of food. That's what we know from our own evolution. So we are fond of this. We are fond of colorful things, not just us, even animals are fond of these. So we found that all these colorful substances, again, need very specific sutures to make either to make a lot of these anthocyanins or flavanols which are present in green fruits. So result of this curiosity driven research is that you can really find how to make these fruits to produce a lot of important molecules such as anthocyanins or flavanols for us. So we also have methods where you can inject these and get the right anthocyanin or flavanols in different plants. 
so we are in the situation we are sort of like in the in the third green revolution which is like 5g just like in phones so here all these changes really matter we have to really study how this happens so that we can incorporate these changes but plus we can also change this recipe by changing very specific changes called genome editing so last year actually 2020 these are the plants which have come about all these can have different nutrients some of them can are so long this is combined potato with combined properties of sweet potato so all these are dramatically you know looking plants which have very high nutrient content but what is missing is we don't know how to cope with the climate stress so many labs including ours we try to incorporate this change uh, we can do it with a method called genome editing so these are the first set of genome edited lines in our lab these are rice plants just by changing one gene we could make the plants now see the way the plants doesn't have to have the leaves so it can have more resistance against abiotic conditions so what's the larger thing so we have we use 90% of all our calories come from just 10 plants but we have roughly 300 lakh plants which are edible we should go back to them start making quick domestication with any one of the methods i said so that we have a food security plus we end up eating five or ten different vegetables and fruits per week at least if not per day so okay so in india we have used up all the land for agriculture what is now happening is we import a lot of food especially oil crop and by 2050 even without climate change we end up buying a lot of our food which you as you have seen with the ukraine crisis it can become a quite a difficult challenge so what we can do now is crop diversification which you and me everybody can do efficient water use we all can do improve soil management we all can do development of climate resilient crops it needs some expertise many people are doing including us so we could counter it counter this this negative impacts but again, what else you can do? This is what we eat now in most households in South India. The amount of water required for a food like this, which is rice and something, is like roughly 2,500 liters to produce just this much. What we could do is go back to what we can eat without. So this is ragi. This is the millet. Needs much less water. Very specific things which doesn't need much input we could reduce this burden. We could also have much more healthier food. Healthier food is, most of the time, this is really wrong notion, such as apple a day keeps doctor away. This is a myth. Uh, apple was grown in North America for a long time, and they were making alcoholic drinks. When church said there is a prohibition, you should not drink, the, all, the, all the farmers were worried. They started saying, if you are to survive, we have to come with a new slogan. So they said, apple a day keeps doctor away, which is really a myth because apple is no different from any of our fruit. In fact, most of our fruits such as guava have at least 20 times more nutrients than apple. So these are the things which all of us can change. Uh, just to highlight, you know, this is one of the hard grain, one of those millet from uh, Ethiopia. This is what marathon runners use. Just a handful is enough to give calorie to run a marathon. Okay, so these are the things which we all can do. All the things, little things I had the chance to mention in the lab came from all these fantastic people. So they are all obviously not just, they don't have plant blindness, they love plants and they appreciate what they can do. And they all do fantastic things. So these four have almost finished or left already. And these are the people who are in my lab. These are our collaborators. A lot of big thanks to all the farmers who, who are very, you know, readily helping us in different ways. Funding comes to our lab from DAE through TFR or through government agencies such as this. And uh, I said there is different perspective. Science is the best way to see to get all perspective. If you do the research, you get somebody will say good research, somebody will say bad research, somebody will say unclear research. You get to hear hear all perspective and if anybody of any one of you are interested you should get in touch with any any one of us and big thanks to the organizers 
and to all of you for listening. Shiva, we talked in detail about how uh, plants, we, we derive so much food and nutrition from plants. So uh, Harini asks, do they give the fruits, leaves and flowers willingly? In other words, do they know we are taking things from them? Are they happy about it? Uh, they are happy about it because then only they can spread wide and far and wide everywhere. And that is their success. Many plants don't like their own seedlings to come below them and compete with them. Okay, they want it to go somewhere else. Very few plants have the capability to tolerate their own kids growing next to them, unlike us. But they can, they help them to go around. The only way is to uh, make them tag along with the animals. So they go everywhere, they conquer. That's what most of the fruits, have, fruits and cereals have done. They're spread everywhere, right? Um, the sort of uh, modifications that humans do on plants uh, to gain more yield, such as grafting, can it be only done for fruit, fruit plants? Or if so, then why? Another so question. grafting can be done only with, with few crops, such as fruit crops, because it is labor intensity. You have to bring two pieces, two properties together in the right time. Usually it is done in August when there's high humidity or you need specific greenhouses. So you need to really put some effort. Imagine somebody has to do that for rice. For 100 plants, if they do, they'll get tired, right? It's not possible. So only a few fruit crops, you can do this and get the better fruits quickly. Uh, you don't have to wait 10 years for the tree to flower. You can get next year. So that's what one can do with grafting. Talking about uh, human modifications to plants, um, we use agrobacterium, right? So how does agrobacterium make these huge sweet potatoes? So agrobacterium, when it makes the tuber, it has it tags two of its genes, put it into the plant. One is to make cell division. Second one is to make cell expansion. That's a basically what a tumor is, right? So those tumors are exactly that. And the modification after 8,000 years ended up making these tissues, which are actually large cells, to accumulate the storage food by the plant. So now plant doesn't recognize that as a gene from agrobacterium anymore. It has become its own gene. And it now stores food so that in the after the off season, from this, you will make new plants. So such relationships are very common and such exchanges are very, very common, including in your own labs where you try how genes come from other organisms are, are uh, taken up very easily in another organism. So this is a very common feature, including in plants. So, so um, most plants, most organisms are naturally transgenic, have trans. Yeah. So we know tumors to be like a harmful to the host, right? So when these agrobacterium causes tumors, Sarika, I, Shashrika, I think, is asking whether or not is it like is it good or bad for the plant? Itself? It's very bad for the plant. It can, might end up killing the plant. Uh, and most of the time, we don't end up doing it. We can't do anything. You saw the kind of tubers it can do. So over, you know, instead of living 100 years, the mango tree will die in 30 years. Uh, it will still struggle because it has to now get more nutrients. Agrobacterium on the other side, it doesn't move everywhere. It makes a tuber, it stays away, it draws the nutrient, and it needs some kind of a specific compounds called opines. That's all it does. So once the tuber is made, plants have to, of course, maintain the tuber, uh, tumor, but there is no other burden. Nothing like something else happens to its system. So if a sick plants plant... plants accommodate such things. You know, plants are very good in accommodating all kinds of variation. But if a sick plant is living next to a healthy plant, will it try to help it? Does it have... Uh, it doesn't help by doing something differently, but it will... St the, die the infected plants will send the signal saying, I am sick. The other plant will sense and make sure the agrobacterium or any other pathogen cannot attack it. So it will have its own defense. 
otherwise literally it should spread everywhere right but the neighboring plant is already ready and it is it it can provide the tolerance against such pathogens so within the plant also different part of the plant will be able to just i showed the example of how just falling of rain can make sure different part of the same plant not just other plant is ready to counter against pathogens Okay. Uh, Ganesh, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we can address a few more questions from the chat box. Um, so when uh, we were talking about the tree which is used for uh, 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 making Nadaspuram, uh, we were discussing about uh, uh, the, the, the tree is termite-proof and waterproof, right? So Shashika, is asked, Shashika and Vicky have the same question. How is the tree termite-proof and how do plants become termite-resistant? Ha, plants, I mentioned plants have been, you know, except the interaction they want to have in flowers and fruits, they make all these chemicals, such as the ones I explained, you know, different type of compounds, and they don't want animals to come near them. That's why if you take literally any plant, you extract a leaf and put it in your plate, you will get antibacterial, antifungal, anti whatever properties. So that, that kind of research you have seen, it comes everywhere, right? These are really low quality research because this is how what plants, you know, how plants have evolved. They just don't want interaction anywhere else except where they want that interaction. Similarly, these trees, these are grown where? Usually in drier climate, leeward side, and that's where you will find termites. So the first thing they would have is termite resistant by making specific compounds which termites will not be able to penetrate nor like. Yeah. So that's true for every plant. Every plant is, that's why I said in forest, all trees are resistant. If okay. they're not, they would have been gobbled up or diseased and they're dead in no time. So each plant has inbuilt capacity to tolerate and prime and make sure, you know, up or down all this resistance. And, and they're always ready. So one way of making is specific compounds to target all kinds of ants and insects because the, the places these trees are grown, these are little harsh climbers. There is not, not much rain and all that. You know, they, they have to also shed leaves. And so it's a difficult climate. They can't afford to, to have the termites with them. Yeah. Okay, so if these plants are termite I mean, have uh, uh, termite proof. Uh, can we make the crops uh, 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 pest proof also so that we can eradicate the need of pesticides, right? So, if we allowed GM, these things would have happened long back. So, thing is, there is such poor public opinion. We can't make them. And But now there is new technique of genome editing, which I said, you can change one, one small thing. We'll be able to do it. There are many people who are doing it. And if and there are regulatory processes in place, except in some countries. So very soon, all this can be made. And whether we want it or not, whether we recognize this or not, such crops will be in the market and we will be consuming them. So oh. it's not very difficult. The, the, uh, the plant biology is quite strong. And people know all the pathways that are required to alter to make the right compounds, so or transfer those genes to other plants to get the rich. So almost 30 years ago, this was already done, but in the last 30 years, we have poor public opinion against GM. Oh, so in that case, if the GM crops are uh, uh, very expensive uh, for the farmers to buy then? Uh, they are not necessarily expensive because they are stable, so you can take little seeds, grow them. In the next generation, you will grow them. There was a story how, you know, how part of, you, including our own country, there was BT brinjal being grown, though it is banned. And the farmers didn't pay, seem to be paying extra money for the seeds. It must have come through Bangladesh as per the newspaper reports. So why is that? All the, all the vendor has to say, these are now, this will make more yield and we will buy them. And they are not very different from other crops where we have to buy the seed. So 
and if it is genome edited crop i don't think there will be it should be even cheaper rather than expensive because the technology is not that difficult to implement yeah yeah that will be really useful uh, if the, the gm crops in the market it, we don't have poor public opinion so <laughs> then only we can have those right okay uh, so onkar asks how is climate change affecting the planting the grain completely because all the sensors they have put they have to now readjust very quickly right so the climate change is so fast they have to readjust if they are in natural climate such as in a forest they will cope i am you know there are so much examples to show that plants just don't just die away even if something happens you have flooding coming today tomorrow it will recede plant is going to be become all right next year but the plants which you have brought from different places such as potato for example it is almost same all plants are same because we use the tuber to grow them they are almost identical their recipe book is almost identical total proteins they make are almost identical they are in a different climate from where they originated they will have difficulty to cope with such changes so in a natural ecosystem nothing is going to happen to plants they will evolve new forms they will modify themselves they will they, they have the inbuilt capability like we discussed in the early part of the talk but only crops will struggle because they depend on us we have been providing them very stable climate which we will not be able to provide unless we make green houses for them yeah um onkar also asks in unisexual plants how does plant decide whether to produce a male flower or a female flower so this is a very technical question most of them some plants make only male flower some plants make only female flowers there are plants which make both male and female flowers so it all depends on whether the plant is ready to re wants a cross pollination whether the pollen should come from another plant so that is offspring daughter or son should have newer properties or its own property if it is its own property it will have the same male and female flowers in the same plant or same flower and end up making small changes to its own its own baby so it depends what the plant wants and accordingly it has designed uh, there are plants which will have only cross pollination and those families evolve quickly there are plants which want only self pollination and they don't thrive much okay they they are usually one genera one species and they don't diversify much yeah so harani asked banyan and tulsi have different types of leaves so does one type of leaf have better sense of making food and another have less will there be a difference in different leaves yes yeah. Well, it also depends so if the leaf is big obviously it will make much more food but making a big leaf like banana leaf is problematic because banana is leaf is going to tear it might end up collecting more more sunlight but it will have poor network to collect and store it right so each plant comes with its own strategy banyan tree can make more food okay but usually banyan tree is in a little drier climate tulsi on the other hand is seasonal it's supposed to grow in a very small time it has small leaf just to cater to make those seeds and go off the seeds fall off they germinate in the next rainy season so it depends how the plants are evolved some of them they are ready to harvest more to make more seeds or bigger plants to harvest even more sun some of them are happy just to live in a short time make what they need make seeds die off and come in the next season yeah uh, harini also wants to know can agrobacterium affect us also uh there is one report that it can affect us but it has not been verified um and if somebody artificially puts something it can affect us so okay. thankfully nobody has done such crazy experiments and usually researchers are quite you know not that careless yeah um and uh, yeah we have few more questions so harni again asks does the shape of the leaf matter really matter to the plants yes shape really matters if it is what we think see there nobody has done real experiments here if the leaf is small and if it is only like this 
and with the tip piece with the pointy tip it can drain the water nicely it can also open and close depending on the day when it has doesn't want uh, transpiration to happen it can close it can open when sun is up it can drain the water all that okay so the shape of leaf is a long evolution exactly to fit into the right place where they evolved yeah okay so if they evolved in a very dry climate they are going to make some waxy layer so sunlight will fall and run away and they you know all kinds of strategies so each of them is like the real brain behind i don't know millions of years of evolutionary brain is at work okay uh, i hope that must have answered uh, 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 harini's question um and sunita is asking why do some plants make fruits with bitter taste yeah i think that's an interesting question because who really eats a bitter fruit so bitter is for us it is not bitter for some other animals so it just doesn't want human to eat maybe we end up digesting the seed and the seed is not going to germinate but there must be some other animal maybe an insect which is very happy to eat that bitter what we consider as bitter and spread the seeds that is the most logical one if there is a specific example then i can give answer who might be the one uh, spreading the seeds of such fruits so i think the word bitter is subjective to organisms right yeah okay uh, so uh, shashika is asking if a sick plant is living next to a healthy plant will the healthy plant help it uh so it's their help is not necessarily the like you know offering a defense thing to the next one but they end up making these signals in the air okay these are all volatile signals so we call them evoc volatile signals which can bring the insect predator for the let's say there is a caterpillar not just the plant which is attacked it will make its own signal the neighboring plant can make those signal so that the the prey uh, the uh, predator can come and eat that prey so that way plants really cooperate nicely way better than humans can do interesting um uh, another question if a bacterium infects a plant does the plant have an immune system to defend itself from the from the bacteria yes plants have always defense mechanism otherwise they are growing next to all kinds of bugs and insects fungi bacteria and what not right only when they are really susceptible they are susceptible We usually it happens when they have a wound when they have a injury or when they are transplanted from another place but if they are evolved in that place they have evolved mechanism to counter every organism next to them so all the diseases as i mentioned in a typical you know established forest you won't find disease only when you transplant when you bring a new either a new pathogen has to come just like covid came from somewhere co2 same way something else came from somewhere then the population is susceptible they love disease then they will develop resistance then they won't care next season yeah um and harni uh, harni is again asking what is the difference between male and the female flower in other words how can we find out the sex of the plant ah so very easy so in in different plants you can identify this in different ways okay if you take a flower and tap it the things which you get very small different color tiny tiny things this is the male part this is pollen right in the middle of the flower you will have a dome like structure so in maize i showed you picture that hairy thing that is each of those is a female part and the tip is the stigma where pollen comes in so in each plant if it is having both male and female flower in the central part with usually a, a like a kodimaram we will have the female part on the side there will be um, uh, male reproductive structures which will make pollen and yeah. this 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 differs in more you know more what i'm saying is true for most of the flowers okay how huh. so uh, litish has uh, litish has a question uh, do plants also have higher genetic variations that we see in us humans and also even i want to add a question uh, which is you know 
um so some of the plants have really really huge genome uh, you know multiple times bigger than human genome so maybe you can comment uh, on this very good questions i think i need an hour to answer them <laughs> but they are true you are absolutely right so all these small rnas they can change epigenetics the way they are packed i mentioned that epigenetic change is variable within the seeds of a single plant that means over time you within a single plant if you collect different seeds they are likely to have different epigenetic uh, machinery plus they are ready to change a lot the, they will have transposons which are active unlike us so for example humans were major component of the genome is transposon in most animals transposons are completely silent but not in plants they can go jump activate things change the way phenotypes is copy themselves and paste themselves 100 times so each genome rapidly evolves so even the plants which look almost identical can have hugely varied genome so they have huge genome variation within what somebody considers as a species subspecies same thing you might have huge variation in genome unlike animals yeah um and finally uh, jay hind wants to know what is the present research activity going on in your lab i mentioned about two things so we have something very similar how this memory works sort of the lamarckian memory you all are familiar with how small rnas are involved we usually go with the curiosity driven research we just want to find out something dig 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 get things usually use multidisciplinary approach that means everything that is needed to understand it and most of the time because if we end up making something new we find a new application for it to improve crops or or something else so we do many and with many different crops but mostly with rice we try to find how this book keeping works how this recipe copying works how this dish making business works in plants and how plants can cope with different stresses and what can we learn from them uh yeah thank you so much i think we uh, have almost addressed all the questions uh so if there are no more questions i would like to uh, conclude the session now um so yeah uh, what an interesting session about plants uh you know we see uh, eat and use plants uh, in everyday life but um uh, pretty sure none of us would have thought about the plants from the plants perspective before um now we know that plants can move they can feel they can you know they are the best chemists and what not um so yeah we had uh, very very interesting questions from our uh, viewers uh, on the chat box uh, so we thank our viewers for attending the session uh, and ask, asking the best questions uh, finally we thank our guest today dr shiva prasad for uh, uh, an illuminating and pleasing talk today um yeah with that i would like to ask our viewers to like and share the video and uh, subscribe to our channel um uh, i think also, that's it yeah. you could also join our mailing list in the links present in the comment section um yeah thank you for joining us and hope to see you in many of our interesting sessions further yeah yeah thank you everyone and uh, bye bye have a happy weekend bye. thank have you have a happy weekend